I'm taking things from I'm taking things from private collections. So I'm showing you a whole range of stuff today and it'll reflect some of the really nice things that you can find on the Digital Film Archive. Some of this material, even though we can't record the session, you can go and look on the website. And if people are interested in particular clips, just ask me and I'll send you the links for everything that's available uh, online as we go. So my role is Access and Outreach Officer at the Digital Film Archive. And the Digital Film Archive has thousands of clips at this point, um, spanning right from the 1890s up to the present day. Um, I'm going to start 100 years ago, back in Belfast, where um, I want to begin in the turmoil that really started this century for everyone who was in Northern Ireland, not just women. But these couple of clips, they're very special because they come from a program um, that was made, um, that reflected a different viewpoint from the Pathé newsreels. Um, and this showed some of the, the kind of people on the ground in Belfast at that time. And some of those people obviously were women. So we join this particular scene. I'm giving you a couple of extracts from it. Where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. That's a quote from Shakespeare. And this uh, shows you some women who are right caught up in the violence of that really ugly period in history where people were pitted against each other and again the working people the the poorer people very often got the brunt of this of this violence so this is a um, a silent clip um, as i play it through i'll explain some of the things you're seeing these are children who have um, been asked to reenact for the camera um, throw in the, the kidney pavers, the, the stones from the street. These are women who are walking past uh, an army checkpoint at the co-op in the middle of Belfast. And this was a scene where lots and lots of people, it was a flashpoint, and lots of people were actually injured and killed at this point during that time. So this was a really dangerous place in Belfast where the new university has been built now. You can see the women in their shawls. You can see the women earlier who are holding the babies. And look at the smiles on their faces. So they turn around and they're, they're smiling. And it's hard to know if they're proud of what's going on, if they're happy to be on the camera, if they're just glad that they've got through the night. And again, you see some women who are better dressed here in the middle of Belfast. They have their clush hats on. They look like 1920s women. And they're walking past the crowd of soldiers behind some sandbags. Um, in and around um, the middle of Belfast. So if you imagine going for your shopping, this was a scene in the 1920s and the women have their baskets and they're just getting on with life. So there's a couple of little glimpses of that particular moment in time. But women were not just passive spectators at this stage. And some of, some of you will have learned about some of the better known figures who were involved in, in uh all kinds of escapades at this time. They were involved in politics at this time. Um, if you're interested, um, you can go on the archive and look at a program called um, Mother Ireland, and that talks about Republican women's roles um, right through the 20th century. But for now, I'm going to share you a, a clip from Fermanagh. Um, you may or may not think of this as a, a local woman. Um, Hazel Laverton had been living in Mahramina Castle at a certain point um, with her husband, but they'd become estranged and she'd um, moved to Enniskillen and was living in a hotel in Enniskillen. And whenever there was a, a, a thing called the Battle of Balik, which took place in June 1922 um, in the villages of Pedigo and Balik, um, it basically turned that area into something that looked like the First World War. Um, all of the, the guns that had been used on the Western Front were brought into the villages, which were shelled. They tried to bring in replacement or uh, reinforcements, and these reinforcements were finding it difficult to navigate the loch. So they called in this lady who had a pleasure steamer. Um, it was called the Pandora. I think she renamed it um, from Lady of the Lake, was, was possibly its original name. But the Pandora, if you think of Pandora's box and all the stuff that comes out, that's kind of what you find when you look into history. Um, so this lady, here's a Laverton navigated this ship through the shallow waters. Apparently, some of the, the locals had um, tried to open sluice gates and let some of the water through to lower the levels so that it was more difficult to navigate the lock. But she knew her way around. So she navigated um, a team of specials, um, possibly including Basil Brook, who went on to become the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. And she landed these people um, as close as she could to the battle. So her role was really crucial 
What was interesting was that she was made a hero and she was called Ulster, Ulster's gallant woman ad, admiral. She wasn't an admiral. She was um, a, a member of the aristocracy who'd find herself caught up in this conflict and she had chosen her side. And then later on, she ended up um, living down in County Leash. And uh, Dr. Eamon Phoenix has done a bit of research into her story. And apparently she was very, very upset about the idea that Ireland had been divided and she could never reconcile herself to the idea that there was a partition in Ireland. So it's a really interesting story. She's a fascinating character. Her, her cause was taken up by um, papers in England. She was talked about in the Times. She was a bit of a celebrity and she had her 15 minutes of fame back in the 1920s, in 1922. So that brings it to a, a really local story. And from there, we're going to move into a story which is, again, an aristocrat, because what you find is that it's difficult to discover ordinary women's voices back at this stage because they didn't have access to cameras. They couldn't record their own lives. They find it difficult maybe to um, have enough agency to be able to speak and to tell their own stories. But what we do have from the 1930s is an absolutely amazing collection from a family called the Campbells who lived in Belfast. They were very well connected linen family. And there's a set of films that have just come onto the archive. We're about to publish them as a collection. There's 87 little um, clips that show, um, I think what's really fascinating in this context is a lot of it is about a man and a woman and their family. Um, and you could really see this woman, the, the, the wife in the, in the relationship, her, uh, confidence developing from a, a sort of flapper, a bright young thing, moving into becoming a married woman who's bringing her children to school. And, and we've just got a little clip. I've made a little montage to show you here this morning. I think it's extraordinary for lots of reasons. It gives an insight into the social life, the class, the fashion. You're going to see women riding astride for the first time at hunts, you know, so women with their legs either side of the horse and other women heading out to hunt side saddle dressed in the kind of traditional clothes. You'll see them playing tennis, they'll be skiing, they'll be doing all sorts of glamorous things and it's a completely different world from those women who were on the streets of Belfast in the first clip that I showed you. So I think you'll agree that's a really interesting character who emerges there. She's got this um, charisma in front of the camera. There are times when she probably uses the camera. Um, you can see also the fashion change and the, it's going from these very sort of elegant hats and coats into sportswear where women are wearing suits and tweed um, and looking very similar to men. You know, you can see she's wearing the, the tie at a certain point. She has uh, things on that look like a suit. So the idea of women starting to appear more masculine in their dress, starting to be more active and to wear clothes that allow them to become more active. But you can also see how money opens doors to people. So if you're from a particular social class, you have access to a bigger world. Um, this particular family was involved in aviation. So she was um, the, the clip where she's wearing the suit. She was actually over in England where her husband was learning to fly. Um, you see her at crashed um, uh, 
sort of light aircraft, you know, where she's inspecting what's going on. And um, they obviously sort of weren't going very fast and got back up again and, and did it again. But even just the the sort of um, the ease that she has and the kind of um, spark that comes out, you can see that she's also passed it on to her daughter. Uh, so she's sticking her tongue out while she's skating and then her daughter's coming along doing the same thing. So this idea of women influencing other women and generational change. And one of the lovely clips I think in there is you see both maternal uh, and paternal grandparents. Um, so the grandmothers are holding the baby, but then the other woman that you see in that clip holding the baby is actually a nurse. So there's a nanny holding the baby and looking equally proud of, of the child as the, the, the grandparents or the, the grandmothers. So I think that's a, a collection that really deserves a lot more attention than we're going to give it today. I can go back and show other little clips of that or show that again later if you want. But we're going to move on from this kind of glamorous um, moment for the bright young things into something that was a little more grim, but something that also changed women's roles in a, in a really cataclysmic way, and that was World War II. So by World War II, women were taking a very different role in uh, industry. They were taking jobs that had previously belonged to men. The industries themselves were shifting production from uh, sort of fine goods through to uh, armaments. And women's lives again changed. They were, they were in demand in the workplace. And the clip I'm going to show you is from a propaganda film from um, the 1940s, 1944. This would have happened um, after the Blitz. So if you think, you know, what Belfast had been through in 1941, this is a film that doesn't really reflect the darkness that happened at that point. You know, it's very positive. It's very forward looking. But you'll see women again in lots of different roles in this very short little clip. Um, I'm going to show you one about linen, first of all, and then I'll show you one about armaments. Linen of Ulster is justly world famous. This flax spinning mill, like many others, now manufactures parachutes. It's a point worth mentioning that every airman who has safely bailed out and every paratrooper who has dropped from the troop carrier owe their lives to the deft fingers of girls. To those in the first place who make the parachutes and again to girls in the service depots who repack them after each use. Parachutes at one time were made wholly of silk. It's now possible to use more than 95% linen. So the Flax of Ulster is saving the lives of the men who bomb Berlin and fight the Luftwaffe to defeat. So that's, again, a really interesting change from uh, making fine handkerchiefs and beautiful bedspreads to all of a sudden making parachutes and having that responsibility that the war effort depends on, on what you're doing and how you're packing things. And I think then the other change is that some factories went from making things like linen into armaments. So I'm going to show you this little clip about that. The gun room of a famous Ulster machine shop, dozens of six-pounder anti-tank guns are produced every week. And that's only one of the products turned out by this great firm. Among the many types of guns and ammunition they make here are anti-tank guns, anti-aircraft guns, and shells for airplanes, for 20 millimeter cannon, and for the Bofors gun. So what's striking about this is that it's women, exclusively women, who are running the machine shop here. So maybe in a, in a factory where linen had been made before, it was an easier transition to think of women um, sort of adapting their initial skills. But in this particular context, women have replaced men who are on the front, and they are coming in to take a new role to explore new jobs, to look at new possibilities for what they might be able to do. So I think um, this is a real turning point in, in women's work lives. But after the war, there is a backlash and women are expected to return to their traditional jobs. Some of them don't wish to. Some of them can't see the appeal in some of the jobs that they were doing before. And what's extraordinary is that um, the Irish Linen Guild was obviously so concerned about this that they created a propaganda film. Uh, yes, yeah, someone has just said that um, the narrator refers to the women are, as girls throughout the clip. That's really well spotted. And Louise, um, I'll come back to that later because we have other clips where women in positions of power and influence are called 
girls. And it's a recurrent theme that doesn't stop in the 1940s. Unfortunately, it, it carries on. It's interesting as well. Some people wouldn't be offended by that. And other people would be kind of irate that they're reduced to the idea of a girl and not a woman. But well spotted. So thank you for, for um, sharing that comment, Louise. That's really insightful. So the Irish Linen Guild decided that they needed to recruit women back into the uh, linen industry because it just didn't seem as glamorous after some of the jobs they'd been doing before or possibly wasn't as well paid. Um, and they made a propaganda film. They used some of the actors from a really well-known and well-loved series called the McCoys. So uh, people will recognize um, some of these people. Uh, also actors who would have worked in the Gaiety and, and theaters like that in Belfast, which were again, very appealing to the working class population. But this is a big scale production. You have Joe Tumulty um, and it's, it's a lovely little piece of film. So you have a girl who's decided to go to the linen mills against her grandmother's wishes. And she's coming back with her pay at the end of the day. And she's bringing a whole entourage of people who are going to persuade the granny that the linen mills are the place for her to be. Hello, Rosie Chaney. I'm having a good time. Yes, granny. Here's my wages from the mill. You mean Calico's, dear? No, granny. I said the mill. Hey, Chain, speak up. My left lug's not as good as it used to be. I said my pay from Riley's granny. Your way from where, Chain? You don't seem to be talking sense today. Speak up. I said I was working at the mill. Working at the mill? Well, you're wee vexing you. What do your mouth say when you're working at the mill? Oh, no, I won't say a word. I think it's a grand job for Rosie to be in. Have you no more respect for your daughter than to let her work in a greasy old mill? Now, Miss McGuire, let Rosie speak for herself. She'll tell you a thing or two about your greasy old mill. Yes, Granny. They're not greasy, and the language is no worse than anywhere else. And once more, I'm happy there, and I like it, and I'm staying there. You've been filling her rosy head with nonsense and telling her the mills are bad. And so they are too. And have you ever been inside our mills, Mrs. Maguire? Well, no. And what's more, I never will. Well, what's it got to do with you anyway, Mr. Finnegan? Take yourself off. Then how do you know so much about the mills, Granny? Sure, everybody says these things. It's common knowledge. What things? Who's everybody? What's common knowledge? Well, everyone knows it's to stand water. That's not true, Granny. We don't stand in water, do we, Cassie? And where do the girls have to go about in their bare feet, Shale? But, but they don't, Mrs. McGuire. That is, they don't have to. They can shoot themselves. Bare feet in the spinning rooms are traditional, and the girls like it too. It's healthy. Ach, you'll be telling me after the while there's no dust without dirty flecks. No, there isn't. The mills are putting dirt removers in all the rooms. The mills have health clinics too. You are plumbing nonsense. You can't control girls' tongues with them gadgets, though. Have you ever heard me or Cassie use bad language, Granny? No, you haven't. They're nice girls that work with us. <laughs> they can't make a good match, can they? You'll find that out to your cost. My sister's making a good match. They're going to be married soon. I will. She'll drag them down to their own level party soon. You just want to make me believe that the mills are a home from home, and I know fine well they're not. Of course they're not, Mrs. Maguire. We don't even pretend they're all we'd like them to be, but they're getting better. As soon as the building restrictions are taken off, they'll all start making improvements. You'll see. They'll have to. Or they won't get the girls to work for them. So you can see there's a lot going on in that clip. There's a lot of different complex arguments. Vita's holding up her, her thumbs on that. Um, so if you want to say some of the things you're noticing in that, there's there's a lot that you could you could talk about and a lot you could play with within it. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting is the idea that the old are being kind of seen as old fashioned and not understanding the new industry. So that's one of the arguments that's being made. The other is that, you know, things like bare feet in the spinning mill, the spinning room are, are traditional. So this idea that the girls have a choice to wear um, no shoes and to walk about barefoot all day. Um, I suppose reading between the lines, which is important in this kind of um, discussion or, or kind of exploration. Part of the reason that they were barefoot is is because of heat. You know, it was really, really warm in the places and there was a lot of water. So if you were wearing shoes all day, um, they would get sodden. And, you know, what would you do when you went outside? If it was cold outside, you, you know, you would have really uncomfortable feet for the rest of the week. Um, so also things like dirt removers being put into the, the filters of the mill. Um, if anyone looks through an old census, if you look back through family members, you will probably find people who had phthisis and diseases which were about the lungs. So these were very often about um, inhaling particles of dust 
um, in places like spinning mills, where so many of our ancestors probably spent some of their time. So it's a very interesting moment in, in the history of the linen industry to try and persuade these young women that it was a good career, that it was a, a positive thing to go into the factory. But you can also see some of these stereotypes of um, never making a good match. So uh, there's an old song, you'll easy know a doffer um, because she'll never get her man. So the idea that the women who worked in factories were one of the words was used was millies, you know, so millie was a, a like girls was a, a, a kind of word that uh, designated contempt for these young women, that they were kind of common, that they weren't uh, going to find good husbands because they weren't as important as other people. So it's very interesting to see, you know, how why someone would go into the mills again if they had had these other opportunities and how galling it must have been for some of the women to have to give up their positions and let the men back in after the war. So all these tensions were were kind of raging, but how they're expressed um, is very cosy and very positive and quite funny. Um, so it's a great film and the whole film is available online. It's called Irish Interlude. Um, you can go and look at it on the website. And again, I can come back and tell you how to find some of these films and you can go and explore them for yourselves later. So we're coming to the 1950s now. And in the 1950s, we have a lot of really beautiful films from the tourist board. Um, and the tourist board, um, they had plenty of money and they were able to make some really beautiful pieces of work, they're very picturesque. And again, this idea that they're very cozy, they show the world in a very um, rosy light. So we had Rosie, the, the, the girl, the, the young lady in the, the clip that we had before. And in this particular clip, we're going to look at women's roles on the farm. So we're going to look at um, what did women do in rural life? What did they um, do and how important were they seen within the farm life? And this is a really fascinating little clip from 1950 from a film called Land of Ulster which visits the Balmoral show and looks at farms all across Northern Ireland. But this particular one is looking at the role of the woman on the farm. It's always the women who rear the livestock and poultry. And they Sorry, can you hear that one okay? Just nod if, if you're hearing it. Yeah. Hens yeah, or mother's yeah, job. It. During the season, she reckons on getting 600 eggs a week from her 200 birds. Not bad, is it, for a busy wee woman like her? And as for getting them to the packing station, well, that's as easy as kiss. The packers send a van round the country to collect the eggs. All she has to do is to put all her eggs in one basket. And wait till it's emptied. It's a great convenience to have a van calling once a week. And there's another thing, and a great boon too. Mother hasn't got to go chasing off to the nearest town for her groceries. There's a grocery compartment in the van, and she has only got to pick and choose. Egg money by rights always belongs to the woman of the house. And after she's paid for the groceries, many's the brave wee sum she'll put away against a rainy day or maybe as a nest egg for the marriage of a favourite son. So I, I hope you heard that, a nest egg for the marriage of a favourite son. So the idea that the, the, the money from the eggs was the woman's prerogative, but what she did with it was use it for the marriage of a favourite son as uh, to give him a little boost in life. So um, really fascinating that idea that the hens were the women's work. Um, a, an earlier clip shows... Um, the, the sister uh, is rearing the calves. So again, that's something that still happens uh, on farms where quite often in a dairy farm, um, the man might do the milking, but the woman might be rearing the, the cattle. And I know a lot of local neighbours of mine who've kind of carried on with that role right through the decades. So really fascinating to see how women's role is evolving in rural life and how it's seen as much more traditional in this film. But of course, that doesn't necessarily reflect everyone's experience. And I think it's really important at this stage to, to kind of make that point really clear that um, the clips that I am showing you are a selection. They're not the whole truth. They're, uh, they're pulled out of a whole range of different clips. And if you pull a different range out, you can tell slightly different stories. 
So um, when I was selecting these, I wanted to show some of the stereotypes that were being put forward. I wanted to show some of the, the, the norms that were being um, described as women's uh, particular roles, the things that they should be doing or the things that they always did, as well as some of the exceptions to that. Um, I'm trying to get that balance as well. So um, I'm interested to see if that clip rang a bell with anyone or if, if anyone has any comments on any of the clips so far um, before, I, before I go into the next period, because the next decade, the 60s, is tumultuous and has an awful lot of uh, change happening in it. And, and I think that that first set, if anyone has any comments on those or any questions on those before we go any further. And I just think to myself, it's funny that some women were against other women, you know, from, from going on. Like, you know, if you look at the granny, that was very typical of a lot of people. And, you know, the suffragette movement or whatever, it wasn't just the men who were holding women back. It was other women. And I just find that a bit strange at times, you know. I mean, and the, the granny had this idea in her head what, what work and life was like. And it was obviously really outdated. But um, a lot of people did have those kind of views. Absolutely. It's really well uh, noticed, Pauline. I think the idea that women are always for other women or that they always support other women, it would be lovely to think that. But I think quite often women are pitted against each other. And whether this is just through drama or whether this is engineered or whether this is something that's normal, it's not for me to say. But it's, it's, it's something that you do observe in some, of the, um, in some of the clips that women are actually set against each other. Um, and that sometimes it's youth against age, sometimes it's um, later on it becomes sectarian, we're coming into that period, unfortunately, in, in history. But yeah, that idea that um, whether generationally or for other reasons, women don't always support each other, I think it's well noticed. Um, but then there are other clips that would contradict that and that would suggest that women do work really well together. And again, that's why I'm trying to show a balance to, to explore these ideas. Someone has just said that um, Grace's Eggs was the firm that used to collect eggs in their area. And uh, so it was a similar van, hopefully, that Vicky remembers. Um, and somebody said the van maybe didn't have the cheapest groceries. I agree. You know, the idea of having groceries delivered probably was someone who had a wee bit of money behind them. Um, so, yeah, that, that's also well observed that it maybe wasn't the cheapest place to go for your, your bits and pieces, um, especially if you have like two people waiting on you, just on you. Um, so, sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry, I remember. Oh, sorry, I remember my granny when we used to visit her. The van used to come out, and she would have all the eggs cleaned and all grated, and uh, she'd be buying a lot of groceries. But she'd have been hiding the money because my grandfather was fond of a drink, and she'd be trying to keep this money away from him for her own uh, essentials. Well, that's a really good point, and I think that idea of um, how to preserve the money that's needed to keep the household going is, is an ongoing part of women's lives um, throughout the century and it probably hasn't disappeared. Um, but I did hear stories of um, in the shipyards, for example, that the women used to go out on a Friday when the men were paid and they would have their, you know, all the women dressed in black with their shawls and the streets would be full of men coming back from the shipyards and they would try and intercept their own husbands um, in order to get the pay from them before they went to the pub and started to spend it. And that was a site that was really familiar in Belfast in the, in the 19, well, from the 1920s onwards, I think, and possibly before that. Um, what they used to do then was the, the men used to go to the pub to get paid. That was their excuse that the foreman would pay them in the pubs. So they had to go there um, in order to receive their pay. But the idea of, of hiding money away and, and finding a way to make an income, uh, you know, to actually have cash as opposed to, to, to just relying on someone else, it's a really strong point and it must have been so vulnerable for her to, to, have, to have had to do that. So thanks for sharing that story. It's a lovely story, Valerie. Um, anyone else have any comments? I know that um, is about to leave. Her. So yeah, where you go, Vida? And I want to you know, you know, these women, they all, the ones that we have seen, they all have been working on the floor in the businesses. Did the women ever have any power to be on the administration? on the higher level of the of the businesses you know or yeah well certainly yeah certainly within the the linen industry there would have been women running some of the teams um so on the on the sort of in the mill you would have had women who would have been in charge of of particular teams um 
and they would have advocated for those women. Um, you would also have had, I mean, right from sort of the, the early 20th century, you had women who were uh, advocates of um, women's rights within within work and working in trade unions. Unfortunately, the archive doesn't have a huge amount of footage of them. So we, we will come back to equal pay and people who advocate for women's rights um, later on where we have voices that are talking about that. But it's a really important point that... Um, Sometimes women were blocked from um, moving forward. They had particular roles they were expected to do and they weren't expected to, to kind of reach the higher positions in every industry. Um, before the 19, I think it was the 1960s, we have like we've definitely got people who are talking about their lives in the shipyard where they were working in sort of office jobs and they were kind of uh, working on payroll. They were, they were working in admin um, and certainly... Uh, I've shown clips in a lot of older people's homes and, and uh, with older people's groups. A lot of them have talked about the, the kind of roles that they were expected to take. So um, typists, um, yeah, working with, with words or working with text, working with things that were seen to be lighter. But then at the same time, you know, you had women doing really heavy jobs and really physical jobs. So again, it's, it's to do with education and luck and contacts and, and where they find themselves, where you started made a difference and where you could finish. Um, again, with, with more uh, sort of people who are well connected in, in sort of linen families, they would have been seen as, as having enough money not to work or not to need to work. So they maybe didn't have an incentive if you were, if you were able to travel about and ski and do all these other things. You didn't need to take an interest in the family business. Uh, it was okay to, to let someone else run that. Um, I'm putting words in their mouth, but I'm, I'm speculating. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Vida. It's a good question. Um, yeah, so Jara said that um, she's, she, she meant that whenever someone was taking the, the money for the eggs and the groceries, that as soon as you got money for the eggs, it was going back into the same van to pay for the groceries, which is a good point. So yeah, by having the two together, they're keeping the loop um, and not, not letting the money leave the farm <laughs> or get, get into the farm for any particular reason. Um, someone made a lovely uh, point here that their um, grandmother worked as an inspector in a munitions factory in World War I. So yes, women did have that um, role in World War I. We don't have footage of it again, but um, I think factories like Mackey's in Belfast definitely took on women at that point. They called them the canaries because um, the the gunpowder stained, the, the munitions stained their skin yellow. Um, so there are posters of that. We don't have any footage of them, unfortunately. Um, but I think um, if you look at um, Ulster Museum collections and you look at Linen Hall Library, they may have um, more information about uh, people who were in those factories. So hopefully that's helpful for you, Francis. Um, and someone's making the point that people maybe didn't have transport to get to the shops, um, so they were relying on a van coming around so they didn't have to put things on a bike or walk. Um, some people were very lucky to have uh, maybe a cart or, or something else. And we have a big debate starting about Farmer Brown crisps now, which that could take us into all sorts of territory, Farmer Browns and Tato's and, and all the rest. Um, so will I maybe show... It, it maybe would be a good point then to have a, a quick little break and then we can come back and show um, th from the 60s onwards, I think, because people are maybe thinking about food now after the Farmer Browns um, chat. So what do you think, Pauline and Charmian? Yeah, I think maybe maybe 10 minutes, um, just to give yeah. you a chance to get a, get a cuppa. Yeah. Have a cup yeah. of and stretch your legs. Yeah. yeah. I must say, I don't know the Farmer Brown crisps, to be honest. Uh, I do remember. Uh, they were, they yeah, they were. Family. Oh, they sold them in school, and then the wee grocery van used to come around our estate. I can remember as a young child, and he had Farmer Brown prawn cocktail, Worcester sauce and cheese and onion. Oh, right. um, oh my goodness, everybody used to go mad from them, but they're long gone, Farmer Brown crisps. I don't know them at all. It was Paris, Paris Bond we used to get in the wee, the wee mobile van I used to love it coming in the in the um Francis you were saying there that it was your 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 dad had um grocery van um it was the highlight of our week the grocery van the coming, grocery van coming mm -hmm. yeah they did have some uh unusual varieties of things as well I remember them stocking things that you wouldn't have got in other shops yeah mm -hmm. So take 10 minutes yeah. and the last one back has to tell a joke. So that's oh, oh, okay. I'm not going anywhere then. <laughs> Man will stay on. I will stay on. 
what's interesting is that um, the person who introduced in the clip, Charlie Witherspoon, ha, he does say that the woman, the woman will speak about her uh, lace making, but unfortunately, if he did talk to her, the interview doesn't exist or we haven't discovered it yet. So we just have this little glimpse into very traditional life at the beginning of the 1960s, but we're going to contrast that with other people's experiences. So here we go. Ireland, there are as many traditional crafts as there are in any other country. There's weaving, basket making, thatching, and another craft. And the facts about this are rather paradoxical because this was not an original Irish craft at all. It was brought over here from the continent. But in various districts, the workers put their own pattern and print upon it, and so it became a, a craft traditional to the district. And that's the art of lace making. Now, in this cottage behind me here, Mrs. Annie Ward has been lace making for, oh well, she'll tell you her own story. This is a really beautiful clip and you could just probably sit and watch it uh, for a long time. But one of the reasons I'm showing you this, it's not just the skill that you have in those uh, hands, but it's also that it shows a rural home, um, what a lot of people would have been used to around that time. And as you see when the 60s progress, what the home was like became a really uh, burning issue in everyone's lives, you know, so the idea of housing. Uh, became caught up with the civil rights, and we're going to we're going to look at that and how protest um, became the norm in in the sixties in in some people's lives. But just starting it with this idea of of things being uh, both very traditional in the sixties and moving very fast and having this great fast pace. And ITV footage, because UTV was the broadcaster that started in the nineteen fifties, and it becomes one of the voices of Northern Ireland. And it was again uh, expressing this tension between the traditional and the modern and, and the next clip i'm going to show you then moves into the modern so i'm going to show you the outside influences that came into northern ireland and this included things like sorry for that i'm going to just look at another uh, girl who is pushing against and i'm saying girl in, in a kind of parenthesis because um, she's someone who plows. She plows her own furrow, as they say. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of the start of the clip and then the end of the clip to see how the female interviewer asks her about her prospects. So this is her in a plowing competition. Oh, sorry, preparing for a plowing competition. She plows against the men. And they do ask her about... Um, what her experiences are, whether the men take her seriously. But then they also ask her at the very end of the clip what her prospects are for marriage. So uh, what she thinks she's going to do. And they don't think of it as in what's her career going to be like or how is she going to take this into farming. They say, are you going to marry a farmer? So I'll just let you hear. Let the best one win. Yes. Now, Elizabeth, do you hope to marry a farmer? Yes, if there's any farmers to marry. <laughs> Well, he'll certainly have to mind his furrow. <laughs> Elizabeth, thank you very much. Thank you. So it's a woman who can be seen in some ways as uh, breaking the mould, doing something slightly different, but she's also being encouraged to think of herself as a wife and as a, a farmer's wife, not a farmer in her right. And I thought that was worth sharing because I know that within this audience, we have people who live in the, in the towns, but we also have a lot of rural people, and that might chime with you and resonate with you. And at the same time in the 60s, you could start to see influences of the modern. So I'm going to show you two women, both beauty queens. And I want you to think about the kind of um, perceptions that you would have about these women. And then I'll tell you a little bit more about one of them. Um, so fashion changing, um, but also the face of who represents women and what's seen as beautiful is also changing. So 
so the two women that you're seeing there, um, the first one is Miss TV Post. Um, she was a, a local woman who was voted a for the TV Post magazine, which was run by EGV. And the second woman that you're seeing is uh, a woman called Raida Faria. And she was the first Asian woman to be uh, crowned as Miss World. She was also the first Miss World to qualify as a doctor. So if you have um, preconceptions about beauty queens having sort of less intellect or of it being a, a sort of thing that people do, you've got no... Um, progression within them she was definitely a trailblazer in more than one way and she actually ended up marrying and living in Dublin so she had connections that she maybe didn't realize at that stage with with this part of the world so again uh, the idea of um, a cosmopolitan international influence coming in and with it new ideas so you were getting people who were uh, breaking some of the old taboos one of them was the future editor of Cosmopolitan magazine, a woman called Helen Gurley Brown, and she's been in, uh, interviewed about her book, which is called Sex and the Single Girl. And this is a really interesting interview because it's taken place. It, it's made to look like she's in bed when she's being interviewed, but it's it's quite interesting. So have a little listen. Well, it doesn't advocate promiscuity. However, Sex and the Single Girl does state the fact that single women do have sex lives occasionally, and it isn't the end of the world when they have them. I think the moral code for single women has probably changed in the last 10 years, and Sex and the Single Girl talks about this new code. A girl simply is not ruined, in my opinion, if she has had an affair before she gets married. I'm not promoting it, but it does happen, and it isn't at the end of the world for her. It seems to me that a single girl can only have a good, rich, full life if she has men in her life. and. I've simply written everything I know about surrounding yourself with men. It doesn't mean that you have to go to bed with all of them. It just means that you have them in your life to be friends, loved ones, companions, pals, men that you work with. I think you're much happier if you have many men around you rather than just one until the time that you get married. So. Again, some people might find that quite an outrageous clip, but at the end of it, the fact she says, until you're married. So this idea that, um, you know, our values might change and our ideas might change at that stage. And it's it's really interesting because she talks about relationship and you can't look at women in isolation. You know, it is about relationship. It's about man in relation to woman. It's about how you define yourself in relation to, to the other sex. And it's about um, finding ways to build that relationship in a positive way. So I thought it was a clip that was worth including for that reason. Um, it, it may or may not set the cat among the pigeons. So uh, <laughs> you can come back to me on that um, and see how it reflects again with your grandmother's experience of being hidden away um, for quite a long time and not allowed to be out in the world. And this woman who again sounds quite well off is, is advocating a very different kind of lifestyle. So in the 60s, there was also the opportunity to look back. So while they were looking forward into the future, they were looking back. And one of the amazing voices that we were able to hear is a voice of uh, slightly outside our time scale, but I think it's definitely worth sharing. Um, a woman who was involved in the Lauren gun running of 1914. Um, and when you see her, she looks like a very unlikely candidate for a, a rebellious type. She's sitting in her little hat and looks very prim. But this lady was involved in um, playing a part in the Lauren Gun Run. I'll let her tell you a little bit what, what she was doing. You know, the gun running, Mrs. Jenks came over to the current and told me the guns were going to be run and that we were to feed 300 men and provide white armies for 300 men. We got Miss Nora Rankin to help us. We went up the town. And we bought two or three hams, and we got them cooked, and we bought, we got bread and tea and milk and various other things, and a number of dozen eggs which we boiled hard in my old home in the fish kettle. And we bought yards and yards of calico and tore it and sh up into armlets and stuck a safety pin in each because we couldn't possibly sew them. So an awful lot of interesting stuff in there. First of all, you would not think of the crucial parts in the gun running as being feeding people. But of course, if people have no fuel, they can't continue with their work. The matter of factness with which she's talking about something that was actually at the time, you know, it was illegal and extremely rebellious. 
also the fact that UTV have gone back um, at this point in history and decided to revisit this story and at that point that they are collecting women's voices, I think that is that is quite significant. So their part in the story has not been lost, which I think is, is really important. I'm going to let her tell you a little bit more as well um, about what she was doing because the, the last part of it I think is, is really great. So here's a little bit more from her. I was going home, I met the DI and he, he shook his fist at me and he said, I'll have you up for this in fun, of course. And I said, what for? And he said, for gun running. And I said, I can go into any court in the land and swear that I never said I was in a rifle all night. How are you going to prove there was any? So the fact that, you know, she was an active part in this um, really momentous occasion in, in history. And yet at the same time, she said she never saw a gun all night. So really, really interesting part that she played. There's another woman who also speaks about the Iron Gun on, and this clip is available online if you want to hear a little bit more. Some men do speak about it, but I think it's just really striking that at this stage in history, um, UTV are actively going to seek women's voices. I think that's really significant. And again, women's parts, women's role was changing a lot. It was still very much centered around home life and around uh, building families. But there was also uh, an ongoing protest movement that had been potentially imported from uh, America at this point. Women were protesting against um, nuclear weapons. They were protesting, uh, they were striking. So they're, they're seen and they're visible in, in a lot of kind of very active demonstrations at this period. It does move obviously into civil rights marches and things like that. Um, but again, the footage we have um, doesn't show women particularly um, in civil rights marches as a unit. It shows people uh, protesting together. But I thought these clips that I'm going to show you next, they look at housing and they look at protest and they look at some of the things that possibly led to the civil rights, um, uh, some of the issues that were core to the civil rights campaign. Surely you've tried to get a council house somewhere about the district? Yes, we've been to all the councillors. We've even had letters from Dr. Reid in the clinic. That's the health doctor. And what has happened so far? Well, when our letters were put to the meeting, they were referred to the rural council. They, in other words, they said it was nothing to do with them. And yet, people from, even from a councillor's own mouth, which is in the paper, said that people got houses from Castle Blaney, Monaghan, and even in Hamilton Spawn, Rich Hill. And I should imagine that we're more entitled to people so you're seeing how the idea of housing is becoming uh, an issue that's dividing people um, and that is is then reflected in uh, some of the tensions that lead towards the troubles um, and during the troubles again women were divided in terms of sectarian lines as opposed to you know banding together to look at things that were important to them um, I wasn't going to dwell hugely on the troubles today because I wanted to look at a positive role that women played at this time. So if you think about it, around nine years after the, the troubles began, um, you had two women from Northern Ireland getting one of the most prestigious awards that you could possibly have uh, received at that stage. And this was the Nobel Prize. So I'm going to show you a little bit of a programme that was made about the award uh, ceremony. And it brings us to Oslo in 1976 and obviously the women are uh, Maria Corrigan and Betty Williams who were brought together through great personal tragedy and um, this just shows the moment when they received the prize for working together in the cause of peace and again people who were commenting earlier about the language that was used around women listen carefully here you'll see something familiar happening This is the moment. 
handshake, a kiss. Each girl receives a gold medal. There's a, dipl a special diploma. Only two copies printed. One for the recipients and one for the Nobel Institute. No money is handed over here, but the Peace Prize also includes an £80,000 award, which I'm told is going into peace funds in Northern Ireland. First to congratulate. So I think some of you nodded as soon as you heard it. It was that word again, the girls. So the girls got the Nobel Prize. Um, so it's interesting because he's very, very reverent about what they're, what they're receiving. And he's very much in favor, the narrator, of, of, of what's going on. And he's very respectful in lots of ways. But that language, again, might just rankle with some people. Um, so it's very interesting. Moving into the 80s, um, again, life was changing hugely for women. You have uh, people starting new careers that were not seen previously as being accessible to women. And one of the, the really striking ones, I think, is an interview um, with an Aer Lingus pilot. So again, uh, some of this is really about progress and some of it is about um, the things that never change. <laughs> again, you'll, you'll understand when you hear this. Um, and as a hobby, it would be very, very expensive to fly all the time to reach the sort of standard you'd like to be. Much better to get paid for it as well, I suppose. That's right, yeah. <laughs> now, most people would expect a woman on an aeroplane to be a stewardess. Yeah. What has been the reaction from passengers to seeing you come on board? Well, initially very apprehensive, and I think they're a bit nervous, but I haven't had anybody complain or get off the aircraft or anything as of yet and they, they're they usually happy enough they settle down and i think once they've flown with there's quite a few girls now once they've flown with a few of us then they don't they aren't so nervous anymore have you seen any of the reaction yourself i have yeah what's it been like <laughs> well it's been quite amusing for me because i don't see flying as a male job but the general public sees it as a very physically strenuous uh job so whenever they see me particularly because i'm small they tend to be very shocked and um, I think just a bit wary of the whole situation. But um, So again, a lot of interesting things there, you know, that you're more likely to be an air stewardess than to be a pilot. And also that she refers to the other girls who are pilots. So is it okay for a woman to use that phrase and not a man? So um, people who were taking up the idea of girls previously, it is interesting that, you know, sometimes people can talk about a night out with the girls and think of that as very positive. Um, but it's who uses it and how they use it and what the context is. So as she was tra trailblazing in her profession for Aer Lingus, you also had women taking up jobs, um, including um, political roles. And I'm going to share a little bit of a counterpoint program about Grace Bannister, who was the first female Lord Mayor of Belfast. And I think you'll enjoy these couple of little clips that tell a little bit about her story and the reaction to her story. And it's a VIP seat today for the man who, by choice, stays in the background. The man behind the woman. The Lord Mayor's husband, Jack Bannister. We had no home line, but it was well worth it. I think she's done a good job Great. for a lady. A good job for a lady. Oh, I'm seeing the faces. Contain yourselves. Um, now we're going to talk to the, the man who, uh, I just want you to look at the uniforms and costumes that people were wearing in this clip as well. I'm glad to see a female has been elected the Lord Mayor of the City of Belfast, and I must say she's doing a wonderful job. Whenever she goes out, it's what I have to do with her handbag if she has to give it to me to hold. It can, it can put me in an embarrassing position. Uh, the first time it happened, uh, somebody asked the Lord Mayor this question, and the uh, Lord Mayor said that that was the first question she asked me, and I said, well, I'm sorry, I've never had a Lord Mayor who carried a handbag. So what's really interesting, if you look at what they're saying, first of all, they're saying that you know carrying a handbag is really strange, but it's fine to have a large goat mace over your shoulder. Um, also, if you think about it, the, lady, the Lord Mayor is wearing um, what is the traditional costume for a Lord Mayor, which is gilt, lots of embroidery, a hat with feathers in it, ruffles, and that's a traditional man's outfit for this role. So in taking on this role, she's actually wearing sort of the kind of finery and kind of feathers and falderals that you would more um, associate with female fashion. So I think it's really interesting that even though they're saying certain things, you can also read 
different things into the clip and you can you can listen to it the whole program is very interesting as well it talks to her daughter who actually had to be the the, the kind of um fulfill the role of the lady mares because the husband couldn't perform some of these functions um so it's a really interesting program about grace bannister and it's on the archive as well so i saw some of you cringe in there i hope that wasn't too shocking a good job for a lady um so while these kind of more um what would you say, uh, traditional roles were being broken down. You also had women who were trying to campaign for equal pay in ordinary um, life in kind of working class conditions where people were maybe being taken for granted and they were maybe not being seen as being very important. So um, the clip that I'm going to show you next is from the 1980s as well. And this is about people who were trying to achieve equal pay for hospital workers um, during that period. Just as important as the actual few pence that would be involved. Are you not afraid that you might price yourselves out of a job? <laughs> well, I said that 10 years ago <laughs> when they brought the Equal Pay Act in. Um, so, I mean, this argument's been around for years. They have priced us so far down the pile can't that we've got to push to get up again. I mean, they can't make us any cheaper than what we are. Mm -hmm. Our argument is that uh, women who make up the majority of this particular workforce um, have been kept down to the bottom grade because they are women. And consequently, all the ancillary workers have suffered. And certainly both women and men recognise that in uh, this particular hospital. Uh, there's a great deal of support from their male So again, the idea that a woman's uh, women's roles within the hospital are not seen as important as men, and that you know, even though they're doing slightly different jobs, they're trying to receive parity in pay. And it's it's really nice to hear that in that clip, the men are supporting them, and the men do feel that the cause is is worth supporting. And again, as I suppose some of you will be very well aware that some of these. Um, campaigns had success, but not everything was successful, and there is still a lot of disparity in wages between male and female doing very similar, very similar roles. What also happened in the eighties was they brought um, women together into the studio to speak about um, things that were important to them at that stage. Um, interestingly, introduced by a man, so an entirely female audience, but introduced by uh, a male presenter. He does address that quite early on in the clip, but um, again, I'll just let you hear a couple of extracts because when we talked about the idea of women working against women, um, one of the, the people in the clip, I think, does address that slightly. Um, We're all set. Now, as I say, I don't want to set the agenda, but I think it is fair to admit that we have set the format, which is unusual in that it is all female, which could be considered to be slightly contrived or perhaps even patronising. Who could comment on that for me? Would you like to kick me off? Well, I'm glad of this opportunity because it has been very frustrating. I want to get down to real politics and talk about timetables for action and what a woman's vision and what she'll bring, what experiences she and perspective she'll bring to the peace process. But it's just totally frustrating. And so if you engineered this, thank you. I think this type of a discussion is an absolute necessity because for the past 25 years, the women of the North of Ireland have been forced to a position where they've taken a back role really in the politics because the, the parties such that we have here from a political point of view are 99% male dominated and I know all of us here appreciate that the women of the North do a lot of grassroots work when it comes to dealing with the problems that we confront here on a daily basis but the recognition that they receive or the praise or anything that they receive for it is not very often recognised. So the time has come really when I think our intellectual contribution, as much as anything else, um, should be appreciated and we should stand up and be kind of it. What, what we're doing at the minute, a number of us, is are organising a conference called Women, Politics and Ways Forward in the recognition that there's no one way forward in this country. There are many ways forward and we would like to bring a whole range of those voices together and one of them is women. Now, the first thing you need to know, too, is that women don't speak with one voice in this country, that women speak with many voices. 
And I think, again, that's what we would like to say to, to the political parties and to government structures and to other institutions in this country, is that what we've tried to do in 25 years and currently is to recognise the many voices that we have had and how successful we have been in trying to recognise the differences between ourselves. And I think everybody would say we've done a hell of a better job than that. Than the Again, I think in, especially Monica Williams' uh, idea that women do not speak with one voice. Um, but I also wonder, you know, you can maybe uh, comment on this afterwards. Um, if you think that women's role during that entire period was entirely positive, you know, is it accurate to say that women are always the peacemakers and always the, the people who are finding the bridges? Um, I know that a lot of um, programs um, that were run in the Peace 4 process did address women and brought women away together on trips. And, you know, that was a way that was seen of, of building bridges between communities. But I just wonder, you know, when you, when you reflect on how long the process went on and how long the troubles went on, um, you know, were all women speaking with one voice? Were all women working towards that? Um, and again, are the complexities reflected in history? You know, are we, are we looking closely enough at the role that women have played um, on both sides of the conflict, both for peace and on the violent side as well? You know, you have you've both of these roles. Um, we're not going to go into the, the women who chose the violent path at the minute today, but I want to reflect on, um, towards the end of the Troubles, a visit that was really, really crucial whenever um, the Clintons came to Belfast. And what was very striking was that um, Bill Clinton was completely blown away by the story of uh, little Catherine Hamill. So it wasn't a grown woman, but it was a girl's voice um, that really kind of stole the show at that particular point. So I want to hear Catherine's um, voice and let her tell you a little bit about her story because she was quite a crucial player at this moment in history. I like because um, there's no shooting and there hasn't been anybody getting shot for a long time now and there's nobody getting killed. Today, as she read her letter of welcome to the president at Mackey's on the Springfield Road, she encapsulated with a child simplicity the entire community's desire for a permanent peace. My name is Catherine Hamill. My daddy works as an assistant at Stuart's Warehouse. I live in Belfast. I love where I live. My first daddy died in the Troubles. It was the saddest day of my life. My, my Christmas wish is that peace and love will last in Ireland forever. President Clinton was clearly moved by her words. He referred back to them several times in the course of his keynote address. So again, this crucial role and the, the kind of spotlight that was placed on this very young girl as the voice of the future. So again, this tension between the future and the past. But also his wife, um, Hillary Clinton, who was there in a supporting role at that stage, um, also paid attention to the voice of a young girl, Kathy, and she read out her words. So again, I'm going to share a little bit of that. All my life, I have only known guns and bombs with people fighting. Now it is different. What I hope, said Kathy, is that when I have my own children, that there will still be peace and that Belfast will be a peaceful place from now on. So again, the idea that this international influence is coming in and recognizing how powerful it is to look at the voices of young women, um, to listen to the voices of children, and that they're highlighting these voices and putting emphasis on them and showing how important they are and they're showing by example that women's voices and young women's voices are really crucial. A big change after the, the 1998 um, Belfast Agreement or the, the Good Friday Agreement was that there were lots more women came in from different communities from all across the world. One of the communities that was here before that was the Indian community um, and this program from the 2010s talks about, sorry, from the 2000s, um, talks about the experience of some women in a Sikh community in the Northwest. So I'll let you hear from them. Religious belief permeates everything because it's not just about worship. 
it's a Bodo way of life. So whilst this is a temple, yes, it's also like the Belfast Centre, a multi-purpose building, a place where Sikhs will welcome also Hindus and even members of the general public. Food is shared after prayer and it's all vegetarian, but as you might expect, the food is not just about eating. The langur, as it's called, is about how we eat. Mrs. Paramjit Sandhu is a great advocate. No matter where in the world you go into the Gurdwara, you would be expected to eat langar. That's a community kitchen. It was started by the Sikh gurus originally, and it basically means that everybody has a right to meal. Nobody should go hungry. And they all sit at one level. That means in the eyes of God, the basic message behind it is that they are all equal, and the same food is necessity to everybody, so everybody should get it the same way. Everybody takes a turn. And so everybody's happy in doing it, and it's, and it's an honor actually to be serving that meal. So we all do it with full pride in it. And men should do it, should, but whether they come up to do it, in the end, you know, when they're serving the meal, some of the boys, the younger boys do come to help serve. There's no discrimination that only women should do it or men should do it. But what can I say about the dairy men now? <laughs> yes, it would appear that dairy men are the same the world over. So I'll let, is, if there's anybody from that part of the world in the audience, um, I didn't say that, it's in the program. But it's very interesting that these old tensions between what's a woman's job, what's a woman's world, um, and what isn't, um, are still prevalent in, in the 20, uh, 2000s, in the new century, the new millennium. But what we also find in the, in the 20, in, sorry, in the 2000s was that we looked back again and we shared voices of people who'd come in during the, the Second World War. So I wanted to share the voice of Ruth Koner, who came with her family to Malayal as an evacuee, uh, sorry, as a Jewish refugee, and lived in Malayal during the Second World War. Um, her family uh, lost around 17 members in the Holocaust, and her mother also speaks on the same program. But um, as someone who stayed in the area and, and became familiar with Malayal and with that area, um, I just thought it was lovely to hear her experience uh, from a child's perspective. I can't remember getting there. I just know that I was lucky enough to get there with my parents and and uh, my sister and the people who got there were lucky enough too. And I remember little farm things because I was very young. But to me, I was there I was on a, on a farm living in a cow wire. And I had lots of lovely friends in school. And, and and friends from nearby Malayal and Donaghadi that that we played with. I mean, there was a woman who sewed for us, a lovely lady, and her kids. They had lived in a converted railway carriage in Malayal. So again, that idea that as time moves forward, you're still collecting these voices from the past, and again, significantly, some of these tell women's stories and fill in some of the gaps in the archives that we had from earlier. And we always look for that whenever we're we're kind of. Um, gather new material into the collections, you know, are there voices we haven't heard, are there stories we haven't been able to tell yet? Um, and it's trying to keep that balance then between, you know, the what is what are the norms that are being expressed and also what are the things that you're not hearing about. But if we're going into, um, so I have other footage I could show you, but I realise that we need a wee bit of a chat at the end and I'm running out of time. So I'm going to bring you to two more clips for now. Um, the first one is from a poll that was taken in the 2010s on Ulster Television, and this poll asks, um, it's, a, it's one of those interesting questions, it asks about who were the most admired women, and the responses that came through um, were in some ways not surprising, and in other ways maybe slightly surprising, but we're going to hear from uh, number nine, which was the wife, <laughs> uh, we're going to hear about number six, who was um, Mo Molum. And we're going to hear about number two, who was Mary McAleese. So these little clips will give you an overview of some of the people who were chosen as the most admired women. And to prove that you're a load of old softies at nine, not a well-known personality, but a figure much nearer to home, you voted for the wife. The reason I voted the wife was having married fairly late in life. Um, I appreciate it, just what it was to meet someone special. Until you're married, you probably don't realise how important the wife is. Uh, but once you are married, uh, it makes life uh, worth living that bit more. 
there is a, a certain strength in women here uh, and your mums too. I mean, your mum has that strength and your wife has that strength, but your wife's better looking than your mum. Uh, you only think you had a full life uh, until you're uh, married uh, with, uh, with a child. You take the average, you know, Ulster wife here first. Just to get up in the morning, she makes the breakfast, she makes the lunches for the kids, she gets the kids out to school, she goes to her own job, finishes her own job, picks the kids up from school, goes home, makes the dinner. Your Ulster man there, he's incapable of looking after himself. He wouldn't even be able to find anything. It's basically because deep down men here know that nobody else would have them. Next, you voted for someone who's not from Northern Ireland, but who played a key role here and made a huge impact on all who met her. At seven, former Secretary of State, Mo Molan. What you really got was this sort of exploding personality, you know. It was somebody described her once as like, you know when you open the front door on a windy day and whoosh, everything blows everywhere. She was a bit like that. Thank you, George. Mo was a completely different type of person and she was a role model. She didn't do the standard sit in suits um, and nod. She interjected. She was known to be very tough. Um, she said tough things to senior men who didn't always warm to her straight talking. Um, and of course we all remember her having to wear the wig. She walked in swinging the wig. She said, hello, Den completely thrown. Couldn't remember a single question I had in mind. Mo Mullen came to Northern Ireland at the time when the people here needed a hug. And Mo was a great hugger. Mo met people, you were on first name terms with her. And I think Mo inspired women. I think it's interesting the fact that she isn't from here, but that people did take Mo to their hearts here. Um, she was passionate and loved Northern Ireland. I would have lived here if I could have afforded it. When she left Northern Ireland, people did feel a sense of loss, and indeed when she died, I know there were many people who felt her passing greatly. So again, I know we're, we're kind of running out of time, but I wanted to show you a little bit about Mary McAleese as well. Back in the world of politics with someone who's performed on some of the biggest political stages in the world. One of the very few women who's been elected a head of state anywhere. She's Mary McAleese. From the bottom of my heart, a heartfelt thanks to them and also a promise to them. Uh, I'm not surprised that the president has been voted one of the most admired uh, people in Ulster, um, not least because of her passion uh, for bridge building across the island of Ireland and across the communities in Northern Ireland. She set her stall out at the very beginning of her presidency and she actually is one of the people that delivered on what she said she would do. Knowing Mary, I thought she could maybe just pull this off. She uh, is, has an amazing energy and an amazing enthusiasm, uh, as well as being someone who is intellectually so again, three very different choices, and again, there were TV personalities in that list as well. Um, but just a, a, a kind of really interesting summation of the political, the domestic, the kind of different roles that women are expected to, to play in society. And that was in 2010s. It seems like longer ago, but that was the 2010s that those clips were chosen. Just to finish off then, um, I wanted to share just some of the things that we're doing at the minute to bring it right up to the, 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 the 100 years. Um, we're working with... Um, organizations who can help us and partners who can help us to look at this material in different ways. One of these organizations is WANDA, and that's a feminist film festival. And they've made a collection on the archive of material that they think is interesting around um, women's experience. We've also worked with, uh, or we are working with Linen Hall Library on their Extraordinary Women project. Um, and that is um, looking at 1965 to today. Um, and women's roles during that period. So we've already done some work with them and we're preparing for an exhibition in October. And then another project that I want to share with you is Making the Future, which was bringing some of these clips to young people and a group that included young men. So the idea that the, the, these clips are not just pertinent to young women or to women, but also to, to males as well. And I'm gonna just finish by sharing this little clip it shows um, young people who were responding to the clips and then also they created clips of their own in response to them. So there's some nice little ones to finish with. Gentlemen, are you worried about hairdressing? Well, you ought to be. 
because it seems that soon one of the last male preserves may go for a burden and the opposite sex. I think she's done a good job Great. for a lady. I think a lot of young people nowadays feel no association at all with political parties and the issues that they address. Um, it's difficult being a woman, but it's even more difficult when you're a woman and you live west of the ban. There's still like elements of it today obviously it's not as bad as it used to be in like the 50s and 60s and all I'm not gonna clip like that from way back shows how far we've kind of come from that mm -hmm. also shows how far we have to go as well i think that um women have taken more action to um, change the way we live for women have to work harder to get the job because it's just how it is It'll take some skill in serving drinks without sort of making a mess of it. But do you not think that it's your, it's your body that was hard and you know here instead of your personality? And Terry, this is for you. I'm still blown away by the fact that this stuff would be shown on TV. I mean, a lot of it just feels rather, you know, it just doesn't feel right in comparison to what you see today. Belfast women have the lowest self-image of anywhere in the UK and they say their teeth and their boobs are the problem areas. So it's just a little um, snapshot of some of the projects that are ongoing. So the footage, even though it's come into the archive, it's not passive. We're still looking at it. We're still sharing it. We're still thinking about it. We're thinking about new ways to frame it and new relevances that it has in different contexts. So that is my roundup of selected clips from the archive. There is a wealth of other stuff that I could share with you, but I have to stop at some point. I'm already a wee bit over time. So if there's any comments, questions, I'm sure you have lots of things that are turning around in your heads after seeing that. I've probably stirred some people's, ruffled some feathers by showing some of those clips. Um, but let me know if you've got any comments or questions or um, responses.